Hello and welcome to the Under Centre podcast. I'm your host, Dara Marr, and I am joined by two of the lesser known members of New Kids on the Block, Fionn Malloy and Jake Woolhead. Guys, when are you doing a comeback tour and will Mark Wahlberg be a part of it? We've actually have one planned actually for later on this year, but we're actually opening up the starting game of the season. So look forward to that. Yeah, but Mark Wahlberg's not invited anymore. <laughs> Marky Mark, I'm a big fan of Marky Mark. Let's not let's not put him down. Uh, well, I don't think he's going to go to an opening game of the season to see Tom Brady throw footballs <laughs> for Tampa Bay now. And let's let's be real about this. But we have another great show for you today, guys. We are continuing our off season series, and it is the turn of the LA Chargers joining us today to talk about the Chargers off season. Is David Drogemeyer from the Locked On Chargers podcast? David, thanks for taking the time to speak to us today. How are you? I'm doing phenomenal, guys. I appreciate the invite. Um, I mean, it's always great whenever you get to connect with people from all over the world that love to talk about football. I mean, I think that's really the best part of this is we all love the same sport, but this unites us uh, across thousands and thousands of miles. So it's always an honor, and uh, especially to talk about Chargers football. I love it, man. (laughs) Excellent stuff. We're looking forward to it. Just before we do, guys, if you haven't already, can you please like this video and subscribe to the Under Center podcast uh, on YouTube? Because that is where you will find our podcast each and every time we upload but two shows uh, a week. We've recently moved over, of course, from the old uh, Dynamo Podcast Network. So make sure you are subscribed to our new channel to be kept up to date with the latest shows. It's the exact same wherever you get your audio podcasts as well. Just search Under Center podcast. You'll find us there. Hit subscribe and you'll be notified whenever we upload our new show. While you're at it, go to our Facebook, facebook.com forward slash undercenter pod. Twitter and Instagram is the exact same as well, uh, at undercenter pod. So go there and give us a follow and then we'll keep you up to date on that too whenever we upload a show. But we're here to talk about the Chargers, so let's start with that. And actually, let's start with the scheduled release Um in this year it's the second year now in sofi stadium it's going to be the first year now with fans which i'm sure is going to be fun finally yeah three prime time games as well to celebrate it this year uh you got your week seven bye as well which will mean the team is going to be playing 11 games in a row uh ending with two divisional games against the broncos and the raiders so what do you make of the schedule release Yeah, I mean, I think it's the first time you get to kind of feel like it's the new year, right? I mean, the draft is done. You you finally know, you already knew who your opponents were. I mean, that's already predetermined. But now you know where you're going to go and how many prime times you games you get. Like you mentioned, we have three. Um, I mean, I think it's just exciting. I mean, looking at the schedule, I think uh, in the first five or six games, you go up against Baltimore, KC, the Browns. That's a really tough stretch for the Chargers. I mean, for any team. I mean, those those teams are all above 500 last year, made playoff appearances. I mean, that's going to be a tough stretch. I think if the Chargers are able to get through that, you know, even at an even record, I think you have to feel really good about where they're at um, and, and what they can do going forward. I mean, I think looking at this, it's not a particularly difficult schedule, at least in my opinion. I mean, if you get through that first stretch, um, then it gets a little bit easier towards the middle. But in the end, there's – four division games in the last like six weeks. And that's, I mean, right. That's when crunch time happens. That's when those division games, they all, they're always important, but that's when they matter the most, because if the chargers are where they want to be at that point in time, it's about winning those division games. The clearest path to the playoffs is winning your division games and getting that division title. Obviously the chiefs are still in this division. They're still the cream of the crop, unfortunately, but I think the chargers are definitely on their way. Dave, you spoke about the the tough games at the start of the season and kind of how do you think the schedule is going to pan out. I want to put you on the spot here. Call your luck. Who are you guaranteeing me that you're going to beat this season? 100%. No questions asked. Sounds good. So there's two potential opponents on 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 this schedule here that I think are guaranteed locks, and it's for two different reasons. One, it's the Eagles. Uh, The Eagles with Jalen Hurts. uh, Just a bad. It, well, yeah, they don't have a lot on the <laughs> defensive side. I mean, they added Devonta Smith in the uh, in in the draft, which gives them another weapon. But Jalen Hurts, it's it's he's very inexperienced. He's a running quarterback. He needs to work on his throwing mechanics. One of the things that I've noticed when I did draft prep on him last year when he was going into the draft is he holds onto the ball too long, and when he does, he gets sacked. And his first instinct is always to run, but 
he <laughs> he runs too soon. He he doesn't allow his passing plays to develop, and then he runs, and then he he takes him out of a potentially more rewarding play. That I think is going to take some more time for him to you know get that fixed, uh, especially with a new new coach over there in in, um, in Philadelphia. I just think there's too much going uh, going on against them for them to have be really to be able to compete with the Chargers. I think the Chargers with a new coach with their defense, the, them getting some guys back from injury and how strong their offense is. I just don't think that that's a good matchup for the Eagles. And the second one, I'll give you a bonus one. It's the Houston Texans, the Houston Texans for very much the same reason. There's so much uncertainty with Deshaun Watson. And let's be, let's be honest guys, even with Deshaun Watson last year, they weren't good. They, they were yep. not good. Even how great he was, it just goes to show you, if you don't have the pieces around you, the offensive line to protect you, the defense to keep you in games, it doesn't matter how good you are because this is a team game, not an individual game. So those two games right there are my guaranteed locks. Chargers are going to beat both of those teams quite handily. I'm glad you mentioned the the Eagles and their quarterback woes because I don't know if you can tell. I'm obviously a Giants fan. I Fiona's see the blue Giants. in the background. Yes, sir. Fiona is wearing a Giants blue, but he is a football team fan, unfortunately. So we're all too aware of Jalen Hurts, <laughs> and we're quite happy with that. To be fa- to be fair, but you do mention that there is three primetime games, obviously for the Chargers this year. But how could you not blame the NFL? Justin Herbert must be the one of the most fantastic younger quarterbacks in the league at the minute. He's definitely the most like excited prospect I'm looking at. What coming into the season that that offense is incredible with him at the helm how do you feel like you obviously must feel delighted watching this guy play football I mean it's absolutely incredible and and also just for the Chargers in general their history of quarterback play is ridiculous I mean you have Dan Fouts then you have Philip Rivers before Philip Rivers you have Drew Brees who is a first ballot Hall of Famer now with who will probably go in with the Saints then you have Philip Rivers who is the starting quarterback for 16 17 years and then you go from that to Justin Herbert. That's unheard of, guys. Like, we've seen so many teams out there draft multiple quarterbacks trying to make sure that this guy's the one, right? They're all excited. They're all saying, oh, yeah, that's going to be the one. But how often does it actually turn out to be the guy? And just the fashion in which Justin Herbert was introduced to the, to the NFL, nobody expected him to start. We uh, at Locked On Chargers didn't expect him to start. We thought that this was going to be Tyrod Taylor's show. He was going to be the guy. He was Anthony Lynn's guy. So going into the season, he was the number one guy. I mean, everyone expected that. And then the unfortunate injury with Tyrod Taylor with the team doctor puncturing his lung, um, trying to give him an injection. Justin Herbert found out literally minutes before kickoff, hey, guy, it's it's your turn. It's time to go in. And a little funny story when he actually went out to, to the huddle, uh, Hunter Henry, the Chargers tied in last year, was like, what are you doing here? <laughs> why are you in? Why are you out here? And they're like, well, I'm, I'm playing quarterback, man. It's, it's going to be me. Tyrod's out. And they're like, oh, okay, well, let's go. Okay. Uh, but, and then he, he, he goes toe-to-toe with Patrick Mahomes and, and nearly beats them. I mean, if it wasn't for Anthony Lynn's boneheaded decision to give the ball back to Patrick Mahomes in overtime, which – what in the hell are you thinking? I mean, <laughs> you're really going to do that? I mean, if they don't do that, there's a good likelihood the Chargers win that football game, and then it can, could be a completely different season. But then he goes on to, I don't know, have one of the most historic rookie quarterback seasons in NFL history. He broke nearly every single record held by a rookie quarterback last year. You can't help but be excited. But I think what makes you even more excited is what the Chargers did in the off season to make it an even better year this year. I would think yeah. one thing that stands out for me as well about him is he's playing extremely well and delivering passes extremely well and fundamentally very strong. I think a lot of these quarterbacks that come out of college recently were much more interested in the flash that's with them than with the fundamentals like you saw with Jalen Hurts where he's he's so been told over and over how flashy he is with his legs that his right. first thought is not to throw the ball, it's to run the ball. Yeah. And what I love about Herbert is Okay, he can run the ball. He's a fantastic athlete, but he's composed in the pocket and he's picking the passes like a like a ten year vet, and that I think bodes extremely well for him. Well, and I think what makes it so confusing is that the offense that he was in in Oregon was so different than the offense that we saw him run with the Chargers. A lot of quick throws, a lot of getting the ball out of his hands quickly, and they didn't really accentuate one of his best strengths, which is his arm strength. This guy can throw 65 yards flat-footed. 
I mean, that is ridiculous. I mean, the arm strength was not utilized enough in college. You didn't see that aspect of his game. So when he got to the pros, Anthony Lynn notices this big, crazy arm. And yes, Justin Herbert looks the part. He's six foot six, 240 pounds, can run, can extend the play. That's where the quarterback play is going at, going in the NFL. You, you love the big, strong arm, but you want mobility. You want to make sure that your quarterback can hurt you in multiple – hurt the defense in multiple different ways. You you can't just expect him to sit, sit in the pocket, which he can do, but you have to expect him to run or you have to, you have to prepare for him to run as well. I think that's what made him so dynamic last year is the big arm mixed with his mobility and in an offense that better suits or accentuates his strengths. Yeah, definitely. And, and like you were saying, the offseason was definitely used to protect him as much as he can, to give him that time to to throw that ball with the likes of Corey Lindsley being brought in a free agency and Matt Fowler. And then, of course, got looking at the draft, uh, Rashawn Slater falling to you at 13. Unbelievable. I, I cannot I, – I, I still, to this day right now, as we're recording this, do not understand – why or how Rashawn Slater fell to the Chargers at 13. It does not make any sense to me. First of all, I mean, we knew there was going to be a big run on quarterbacks, right? We didn't know who, you know, those quarterbacks were going to go to, but we knew that there was going to be several of them going. I think what we didn't really anticipate was the amount of wide receivers that went so early. I mean, I knew uh, there was obviously some great guys that were there, but I don't think we expected them to go before the Chargers at 13. But I think the biggest domino for this situation that allowed Rashawn Slater to get to the Chargers at 13 was the Lions taking Panesua at seven and then Carolina passing on Rashawn Slater. I think as soon as Carolina passed on him, I think it started to become more and more of a possibility. But even then, this guy was the consensus second top left tackle and it could have been the best left tackle, depending on who you talked to last year. His technical ability, his his pass protection, the way he uh, executed in the run game. This guy is a complete tackle. He's a guy that steps in and, and he can play that position at an NFL level right away. So when those dominoes started to fall and then, you know, with the Chargers, we have a saying, you know, the Chargers are going to charge her. So even when Rashawn Slater was available there at 13 for the Chargers, you just said to yourself, these idiots better not make the wrong decision. They better not go with somebody else, but they didn't to their credit. This was the perfect marriage of availability and position of need. They take the absolute best guy to help them in this situation. And it gets even better because in the second round, their second top need a corner as Casey Hayward left in free agency, the Chargers kind of parted ways with them. They needed another uh, top corner to start opposite of Michael Davis and Asante Samuel Jr. from Florida State falls directly in their lap. So they address their top two needs right away with their first two picks. And at that point, it's almost like I don't care what happens with the rest of the draft because their two biggest needs were filled and filled emphatically. Dave, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. ahead there. No, I was just going to mention just uh, one other uh, pickup in the draft that I liked was actually the pickup of the uh, tight end Trey uh, McKitty in the third round. It sort of helps ease the loss uh, of Hunter Henry um, and you know, going in there behind Jared Cook as well, who obviously is a veteran who probably won't be playing as many snaps as Hunter Henry could have been able to. So, you know, it's definitely, they are definitely building to give um, uh, Herbert as much, uh, as many opportunities to succeed as possible. Well, with Trey McKitty, I, I think it was just uh, we didn't expect him to go in the third round. I mean, when we did our draft prep before, you know, leading up to the draft, this is a guy we were seeing in the sixth and seventh rounds in many different mocks. And I think this was really a, a kind of a panic decision a little bit because they wanted a blocking tight end. I mean, they already have three guys on the roster that can catch footballs. I mean, Jared Cook, obviously the veteran. Then they have Donald Parham, who is a giant. He's six foot eight. He just has a ridiculous wingspan. He's a big target as well. Steven Anderson's another uh, tight end, but all these guys are pass catching tight ends. They're not really known for their ability to pass protect or run block. And you need that. You need that aspect. If you want to have a well-rounded tight end group, you want guys that can catch the ball and that can block. So when Tommy Tremble got taken, I think that was the, okay, well, who's the next best blocking tight end out there? Well, that's Trey McKitty. So, the, the Chargers take Trey McKitty as their blocking tight end. I think a lot of Charger fans were a little bit 
surprised to see him go that early. But as you look back on it and you understand this is going to be more of an inline guy, he's going to be a run blocking tight end. He does have some pass catching ability, but his primary function in this offense is going to be that run run blocker and that pass protector, that extra offensive lineman, if you will. David, I was, I was originally going to point out, um, you guys have talent like across the board. Obviously, we've talked about Herbert Eckler is an excellent running back. Phenomenal. Uh, Keenan Allen is a stud at wide receiver. We have obviously bolstered the offensive line. Linval Joseph on the defensive line. Joey Bosa. Uh, I love Derwin James as well. I think he's a great player when he can stay healthy. How do you feel about the rest of the wide receiver core, though? To me, that seems like the biggest lack of depth on that on that roster i don't know if you agree with me looking at you there but i don't know i just feel like it could be maybe that second guy could be a little bit stronger than mike williams well i think the chargers were thinking a little bit along the the same lines as you when they picked up josh palmer in the third round as well they added another wide receiver but for me i look at josh palmer as the contingency for mike williams mike williams is in a contract year this year and it's really one way or another he's on a fifth year option so he's getting paid at the top five of his position he's i think he's making 15 plus million dollars this year so if he goes and balls out then he's going to be expecting a big contract if not then well you already have your contingency built right in with josh palmer but two guys i think a lot of people don't really understand or know about is jalen guyton and tyron johnson these two guys combined for five plus touchdowns of 50 plus yards or more these are your burner type wide receivers these both both these guys run four three Okay, they provide that different element to the offense. You got Keenan Allen, who's that possession receiver, who's completely pretty much unguardable. I mean, I don't think there's anyone in the NFL that can guard this guy one on one on a consistent basis. I mean, he's just that lethal with his, his, you know, his get off and his ability to catch the ball and one of the best wide receivers on third down as well. Um, And Mike Williams is your big jump ball play guy, right? I think Josh Palmer fits in that mix a little bit, although he's a much better route runner, I think, than Mike Williams is. But I think that room's actually pretty well rounded. I mean, you have the the pass catching guy, you have the big play guy, and then you got the two burners with the speed. So I think looking at that room, I think it's actually more complete than most people look at. For me, mm-hmm. I think the biggest opportunity on this is actually on the defensive side, and it's with the safeties. The Chargers safety group right now with Derwin James and Nazir Adderley, these two guys, I mean, they're great, but Derwin he's had injury issues the last couple of years. I mean, when he's on the football field, he's one of the top safeties in the NFL. And I don't think that's refutable at all. I mean, he's just an absolute, he's a weapon. He can cover, he can tackle, he can take the ball away. He, he's just, he's an animal, but you have to plan for that contingency. They, they, they got a guy late in, in the draft. Who's going to be a, a kind of a, a hybrid safety type uh, I mean, you, just, you can't really depend on the seventh round pick to come in and, and really provide quality depth. So Nazir Adley had an up and down year last year at the free safety position. They lost Rayshon Jenkins in free, free agency. So that group right now, to me, I think if you're looking at this whole team and you're looking at a deficiency, I think that is the position group that they need to add to. And, and if they do that, if they add a veteran body to that, I think you're looking at one of the more complete teams in the NFL right now. We can edit that question in post to make it sound like I said the the defensive position and make me look a bit more <laughs> a bit better. No way, it's all staying in. That's a, it's all it's on the staying record. In. It's on the record. <laughs> but let's have a look at the coach Brandon Staley because it is going to be his first job as a head coach. Now, of course, he has spent time with with the Bears and the Broncos, and obviously, most notably last year, being the defensive coordinator for the Rams. So he's not ma- he's not making a move too far to uh, become the Chargers' head coach. Uh, what have you thought of him so far? He's extremely well-spoken. I mean, I think this is a guy you get really excited about listening to. I mean, with the the past few coaches the Chargers have had, whether it be Mike McCoy, Malibu Mike, or Milk Toast uh, McCoy is what I like to call him. I mean, that guy is absolutely terrible in press conferences. And then you have Anthony Lynn, who he had his favorites. I mean, he played his favorites and I never really got the sense that he was really putting the best guys on the football field. I think he was more of a guy that was more uh, worried about his relationships with players. He's very much a player's coach, but he also had some time management issues that, and just some, some really weird, bad decisions that we didn't really understand. And so with Brandon Staley, I mean, he's so genuine. 
he he's so very well spoken. I mean, he articulates extremely well. He he tells you what his vision is, and and that's so nice to hear. You just don't see NFL coaches out there that are that as are as open and honest as Brandon Staley is. And he su- surrounds himself with a good team. He goes out and gets guys from you know, some of the best offenses in the NFL, like like Joe Lombardi with the Saints. <clears throat> he gets. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry, I'm blanking on the name right now. Uh, he gets Ronaldo Hill, the defensive coordinator from the Broncos, who has had a very, very good uh, defensive system there with Vic Vangio, who is one of the best defensive uh, minds in the NFL right now. I think Brandon Staley, with his number one defense, I think you expect to, to, to see that, you know, the way he orchestrates his defense, move over to the Chargers. And I think you just can't help but really be really excited. But, again, this is all talk, Right. I mean, we got to see results on the football field, and then that will really determine how we view Brandon Staley. But as of right now, everything he said has checked a box. So it, it sounded good. Now we got to go see if it looks good. Okay. Well, before we let you go, we, we were talking, obviously, setting up this interview beforehand, and, and I promised you to see if I could get maybe a curveball question in here. Let's so I'm going to try my best now with this one. So – we we've had we've had the announcement over the off season that Drew Brees has finally retired yeah. after twenty plus uh, years in the league. Fantastic career, of course. He spent a couple of years uh, at the Chargers um, before uh, being re- released and then going obviously going ahead with Philip Rivers instead. If you could take it back, would you keep? Would you have kept Drew Brees even though there was questions around his shoulder at the time? Would you keep Drew Brees, and then would you have not gone after Philip Rivers? No, I, I wouldn't, and it's because of the shoulder injury for Drew, Drew Brees. I mean, I think at that moment in time, there's so much uncertainty, and especially when you're talking about one of the vital parts of your body when you're talking about a quarterback, you just don't know if everything's going to heal the way it was supposed to, and you had already drafted Philip Rivers. You had him on the roster for a couple of years, and this guy, by all accounts, had everything you wanted as a quarterback at that point in time in the NFL. He was a true pocket passer. Drew Brees, obviously, looking back, hindsight being 2020, being one of the best quarterbacks in NFL history, most passing yards. I mean, his accolades, obviously, are a mile long. I respect what he has done. I've watched him from afar. He's been a phenomenal player, had a great career. But Phillip Rivers is one of the true competitors and characters in the NFL, I think, in NFL history. I think his sound bites are appointment television. I mean, I don't think anybody provides a better. I think he's really built to be a color commentator. I mean, I think you, you'll you see him on Sundays in the future. He already had a job to be a high school head coach you know, head football coach. That's what he wanted to do with his life. He's had that already kind of set up for years, but I think you'll see him in a booth calling games before long. But to answer your question, I would have kept Philip just because I've enjoyed watching him throughout his career. And not a single curse word ever came out of his lips as well. Not a single one. (laughs) You know that he's going to be good in the booth. You don't have to worry (laughs) about, you don't have to worry about any F-bombs flying out there. Those expensive sensors, as you know, Dara spends about $200 a week censoring my head. That's right. Yeah, that's right. You're going to hear some horse mess. I mean, that's, that's, that's what Phil Rivers loves to say. Excellent. Well, David, really appreciate the time uh, today uh, talking to us about all things charges. Before we let you go, where can people find your podcasts and your socials? Yeah, so uh, I do two different podcasts. Uh, one of them is just our personal one that we do during the season. It's called Chargers Domination Live, and you can find us on Facebook at that name, Chargers Domination Live. If you want a little bit more regular, then that's the paid gig. That's uh, Locked On Chargers. I work for the Locked On Podcast Network. We put out five shows a week, 52 weeks a year, guys. We're always pumping out shows, 30-minute shows every single day. So find us on Twitter at Locked On LAC. Find us on Facebook at Locked On Chargers. We're pretty much everywhere. And of course, everywhere you get your podcasts, we're going to be there. But hey, appreciate you taking the time to, to talk some football with me. I appreciate the invite and hopefully we can do this again sometime. No problem. Definitely. We would love to have you on. If not 
again before the season at some point during the year. It, it may be even the week before the season because with Fiona, our Washington fan, and you, obviously, our Chargers fan, we've got a great preview right there. <laughs> Let's we do it, Just man. let you two go at it, and me and Jake will just sit back with it. Well, with well a I hope, I hope Washington do their research on the Chargers team better than I did because I had the wide receivers <laughs> of the weak point. That's clearly not the weak point, so... <laughs> <laughs> no, it'll be fun for sure. I mean, that's a tough matchup. That's a, that's an under the radar team. I think a lot of people don't understand that is a great defense and an up and coming offense. And now that they have a quarterback that can actually play somewhat decent, <laughs> then you'll you'll see some better results this year. We've David, been hearing that a lot lately. His ego is getting too big. You might not be able to leave the bedroom. Now remember, he, he he's the current day gunslinger though, so I can't get your ho- yeah. get your hopes or your head too high because yeah. remember, Brett Favre threw a lot of touchdowns, but what else did he do? He threw a whole hell of a lot of interceptions too. Brian Fitzpatrick this year is going thirty one for thirty one. <laughs> <laughs> Have a Jameis Winston year. Yeah, he's going to oh, break the man. record. <laughs> that. Well, you might actually, but to be fair, if you keep James Winston in and he's getting close to that 31, that, that's shame on you. That's your own fault, okay? Exactly. That's your own fault. But that is it for this show, guys. Uh, if you haven't already, please like this video and subscribe to the Under Center podcast on YouTube. Do the exact same thing. If you prefer the audio version of the show, just go to wherever you get your podcast. Search Under Center podcast. We'll be right there. So subscribe to that as well. Also, facebook.com forward slash undercenter pod. Twitter and Instagram are both the same at undercenter pod. So that is it for another show. Uh, we'll be back again uh, probably next week, continuing our, our off season series, looking at some more teams and looking ahead to the upcoming season as well. But until then, stay safe and we'll speak soon. Awesome. Excellent stuff. Thanks, so much, Thanks a million, David.